Yes, and, and thank you all of, the, of, all of you for being here, for staying this long. So hopefully, I'm getting 10 minutes more, but I don't intend to, 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 to speak that long, okay? So, because I see people escaping already, so. Uh, okay, so I'm Lucas Benedicic. I'm a member of the Systems Integration Group at CSCS. Um, I've been lucky enough to be working with, uh, with these uh, people here listed, Felipe, Alberto, and Kean uh, on uh, containers for HPC. And uh, I also, you know, the lucky guy that gets uh, to present the work that we've been doing for the last year, roughly. <clears throat> so I would start maybe with, a motivate, with a, how to motivate this talk. And I think that uh, if, uh, if we go back a couple of days, uh, uh, we can remember that uh, containers were mentioned in different contexts. So uh, we can remember, uh, we, we remember, for example, that DK presented a, a particular MVAPIC implementation for, for container runtimes. We also had some vendors uh, talking about containers. I remember Lenovo uh, saying something about containers. We saw, we, we actually heard and saw examples also from industry. Novartis, if I remember correctly, uh, mentioned that they are um, analyzing or, or, or uh, researching uh, using containers. We heard also some uh, use cases from uh, research. Uh, and result reproducibility yesterday from EPFL that Jill presented. So uh, I think that uh, if you agree with me, I think we have a context uh, for, for presenting this work. So um, this is more or less what I'm going to talk about. So let's start with the first and the compulsory uh, Slide about Docker, sorry about that. It's the only one, by the way. And uh, you will see why this is important, you know. Um, I imagine that all of you are familiar with Docker, but um, just in case, and so that we start all, you know, from the same page. What Docker provides is <clears throat> Linux, uh, it relies on Linux kernel features to create semi-isolated containers. What this means basically in practical terms is that it captures all application requirements inside one binary block. Um, it also gives us easy to use uh, recipes files and version control given uh, uh, image creation. That basically means that a blob is created out of layers that mark the deltas between different versions of your container. You don't get one big blob of the last version, but that complete timeline that actually uh, the container um, the container changes help us got, got there. In terms of the environment, Docker gives us the pull and push images from a community-driven hub like GitHub, but with uh, binary images. And what is Shifter? For those of you that do not know what, what Shifter is. So Shifter is a, a runtime, I have to be careful, I don't want to fall. So Shifter is a runtime to increase the flexibility and usability of HPC systems by enabling the deployment of Docker-like Linux containers. So that's the marketing line, okay, of Shifter. What this means in practical terms is that you can pull images from the Docker hub and without any changes, deploy them on an HPC system, okay? Now, this shifter was originally de developed at NERSC uh, by Douglas Jacobsen and, J and Shane Cannon, and uh, CSCS is collaborating with NERSC and extended shifter to add some capabilities that I will show you, some particular capabilities, key capabilities we, we understand that I will show <coughs> Sorry, that I will show you later. What shifter provides you is, um, to be able to run complex software stacks using different Linux flavors. That means that you are not, as a HPC user, you are not locked anymore into the uh, Linux distribution that the vendor provides you, but you can go and 
install your favorite application or, or your favorite workflow with the Linux distribution that you want. What it basically means is that you can potentially develop an application on your laptop and deploy it on an HVC system, leveraging on the Docker workflow. It also gives you integration because you get access to the shared resources of the HPC system. That means you get access to the parallel file system, to accelerator devices, and high-speed interconnects. It is, as I mentioned earlier, fully compatible with uh, Docker images. That helps, of course, improve the result reproducibility. So something that uh, Jill was uh, telling us about yesterday. Now, the compatibility is not Docker specific, but Shifter actually implements its own format, and we just have a translator sitting on top of that that gives us the possibility today to understand the Docker format, but tomorrow, if the, uh, if the industry de facto uh, standard changes, we can move along and follow. Okay, but there is a problem with containers. I mean, for us in HPC. Containers have been designed to be hardware and platform agnostic, okay? So that is where you get your flexibility when deploying applications. You are completely isolated from the environment. So how do we go about then to access specialized hardware resources as GPU devices or high-speed interconnect? That's the question. So last year, we. CSCS worked together with NVIDIA to co-design a solution that, provide, that provides direct access to the GPU device characters from inside containers. And we do some black magic, some automatic discovery of the required bar libraries that you need in order to access the GPU at runtime. In particular, this solution is the one that uh, is integrated in the DGX1 software stack. So if you are one of the lucky, lucky owners of uh, DGX1, you will be using this, okay? What CSCS also did, now on our own without, without NVIDIA, we extended this design to also cover the MPI part. And I will show you some numbers and, and how that works later. So let's start with GPU support. And let's start simple using the official NVIDIA CUDA 8 image that any of you can download from Docker Hub. So for those of you who are not familiar with Docker files, um, here is a, a very simple example of how one might look like. So in the first line, we are basically defining that the base image upon which we are building is the official CUDA 8 image from NVIDIA. The sec with the second line, the only thing that we are doing is basically installing, uh, installing, uh, no, actually, yes, I, I made a mistake here. I'm missing some lines. So what we are basically, what, what, what this line makes, uh, means to be doing is to install in make, okay? Because make is not part of the official NVIDIA CUDA image. So once we get make, we just compile uh, two of the samples that are built into the, in the CUDA runtime, device query and device query driver. And this is what we get. We started in, in Docker, using Docker on a laptop with a GPU, with the discrete GPU there, and we use the NVIDIA Docker uh, binary. It's just a wrapper around the, the Docker binary that gives you access to the GPU. Uh, once the image is pulled, so once the image is downloaded from Docker Hub, we just execute it with the binary that we compiled in the slide that I showed you before. And what you get, of course, is from inside the container, in this case Docker, uh, device query starts, and it actually tells us that it found a CUDA-capable device, so a GPU in that particular laptop. 
So let's move now with the very same container to a GPU cluster using shifter and slurm. So the first step is the same. The only difference when pulling an image is that we are not using Docker this time, but we are using the image manager for shifter. The name of the command is shifter image. We pull and we provide exactly the same image name as we provided for Docker. Then we move to the execution once the download is finished. We move to the execution, so we see the, uh, the well-known S run, followed by the shifter binary. This is what activates the runtime to deploy the container, and the name of the image that we want to execute, followed by the binary that we want to start from this particular container. As you can imagine, it works, because otherwise I wouldn't be here showing this to you. And uh, we can see here that it actually discovered, again, the device query, it uh, discovered a GPU, a Tesla K40M, on the node, on one node of this GPU cluster. Now, one important remark regarding GPU device numbering. What happens in multi-GPU nodes. What we need for application portability is to be consistent regarding the numbering, the numbering of the GPU devices. What this means is that a containerized application has to consistently access the GPU starting from ID zero. Okay, why? Because otherwise we will have to rewrite the application depending on the, on the number of GPUs that are available at every single time to a container runtime. And let me show you this with an example. So imagine that we have a, 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 a GPU, a multi-GPU node with three devices. So we rely on the environment variable CUDA visible devices, and we, may, we make two of these GPUs available to a container. We just export this, so we, this is exactly the same way as any CUDA application works, okay? So we are not creating any, uh, a new layer of complexity here. We are just extending what already exists for CUDA. And by doing this and running device query again, the output that you get is this. So now two CUDA capable devices were detected in a multi-GPU node of three devices, only two were detected inside the container, and the device zero is the Tesla K40M that we saw in the previous slide, whereas device one is a Tesla K80. But look up here, actually the physical device ID of the Tesla K80 is device ID two. But inside the container, it shows consistently as if the node had only two devices, okay? So let me show you some, uh, some examples. So the embody example that comes with CUDA, okay? So that we, we stick with the same image that we were working with uh, so far. What I will show you here is the numbers, the, the performance numbers uh, of the same image, the same example, without the need of recompilation, in four different systems. The first column shows the gigaflops of the native version and the shifter, well, okay, in this case, because it's the laptop, is the NVIDIA Docker version that we are using, the gigaflops of the native and the native version. Then using exactly the same image here on a GPU cluster deployed with shifter, we get this speed up based, of course, on the gigaflops of the laptop. On a multi-GPU cluster, we get this speed up, and on PS9 using the P100, we get this speed up. Same container, no changes, okay? Exactly the same container, no recompilation needed. We do change, of course, the libraries at runtime, but Shifter does that for you automatically. You don't have to worry about that. 
Another example, TensorFlow, because deep learning. So we all know what TensorFlow is. So the same example, the official TensorFlow image that you can download from Docker Hub, this one is single node. But you can use it with a GPU, okay? So it has GPU accelerated uh, functions or functionality inside. So again, performance relative to the world clock time on the laptop. Uh, we actually used this MNIST, I think, uh, test case yesterday during the tutorial, if I remember, if any, anyone was there. Again, laptop, world clock runtime. This seconds, this number of seconds, six times faster on the GPU cluster with the K40, almost seven, or a little over seven time, 17 times speed up on peace diet using P100. The CIFAR 10, 100,000 iterations for anyone who actually understands what that is, I don't. Uh, this is the runtime, the work clock time on the laptop, same image, same deployment using shifter on the GPU cluster and uh, the speed up, almost four times speed up on PCD with the P100. It seems, you know, like this four times only on PCD on the fastest supercomputer in Europe is not enough. But as I told you before, this is single node. So this is the speed up that you get for free just by changing the GPU on one single node. Okay, that's why the speed up is like that. MPI support. So how does this work? So we leverage actually on something called ABI compatibility initiative. It was signed by uh, major vendors of uh, MPI libraries that rely on the uh, MPitch uh, branch of MPI during supercomputing 2013. That is MPitch, the base one, uh, IBM, Intel, Cray, and MBAPIC. So they all have ABI compatibility. That means if that you develop using MPitch, for example, 3.1, and then you deploy somewhere uh, in, a, uh, in, in a node uh, that has IBM MPI or Intel MPI library, if these versions match, you don't have to recompile your application, it will run. Okay, that's ABI compatibility. So how this looks like, uh, using shifter. S run again, so this is, uh, we are using slum once again with two nodes, the shifter binary to indicate that we, are, we want to run an image, and you can see here the minus minus MPI. With this modifier, we activate the dynamic uh, runtime um, library check for the MPI stack. And we do this explicitly because the number of libraries that uh, actually involved in this process is uh, a little bit uh, longer. Let's see that the list is much longer than for the GPU part, okay? So there is a, a little bit of an overhead that is constant, of course, because it's directly related to the number of libraries. It has nothing to do with the application. But for the time being, we said that we want the, the user to do that explicitly instead of for instead of everyone suffering that constant overhead. Then we put the image name and uh, the binary that we want to run. So in this case, for example, the OSU latency. So what we do is that at runtime, the MPI's libraries from inside the container are swapped with the host, uh, with the host installed ones, okay? So in our case, for the Cray, for, for PeaceDind, what we are doing is finding your MPitch compatible libraries and changing them with the Cray MPT or that runs on top of the Aries interconnect, of course, with hardware acceleration. Okay? This is what is happening under the hood. This is what you activate with minus minus MPI. Some numbers. Also latency. So there are many numbers here, but just concentrate on the column that is entitled Shifter MPI Support Enabled. The A, B, and C means A, MPitch 314, uh, B, MBAPitch 2, 
and see Intel MPI. This is the native, uh, the, the runtime, uh, sorry, the um, latency on a native installation, and this is the normalized uh, latency on the different um, combinations of message size and MPI implementations. So what you can see is there is no loss in performance whatsoever, okay? So we are taking full advantage of the MPI stack, the hardware accelerated MPI stack installed on the host. Just by adding minus minus MPI. No recompilation needed here, again. Of course, as soon as we, def we disable shifter MPI support, so maybe we forget to put minus minus MPI, then you will see, okay, things get slower. They work, but much slower. So let's put all together now. So GPU plus MPI support. And we did that to, uh, to launch an application called PyFR. Uh, what it does is it solves advection diffusion type problems on streaming architectures. So basically it does uh, fluid dynamics, okay? And um, one of the interesting approaches of this application is that it will dynamically generate the code for the underlying, to run uh, optimally on the underlying hardware, okay? So that's the Python part of the application. It generates the code, it compiles the binaries, and then it distributes them on all the nodes in order to be as performant as possible. It was one of the Gordon Bell's Prize finalists last year. And uh, what we did is uh, we, we managed to get GPU and MPI accelerated runs using the same container image of PyFR. And what I'm going to show you here is the parallel efficiency for a 10 gigabyte test case on different test systems. Okay, so for a, for a number of nodes, one to 16, with a 10 gigabyte test case, you can imagine that we couldn't run on a laptop, but the image, the container was built on a laptop, okay? So the first test case for this container in particular was already deployed on a GPU cluster. So what we can see here is basically that we, have, we get the portability, okay? That this test case in particular is designed for a four node launch. So that's when, why we see for the eight and the 16 that parallel efficiency starts uh, declining. In any case, what this gives us is a perfect um, match container, or a container with a perfect match for portability and for performance, the two, high, the two features that I want to highlight here. Okay, so then what happens when, when, when we do deployments at scale? We used uh, a, test, uh, a test case, and it's called Pynamic. What it does, it is test uh, that startup time of workloads, but simulating the dynamic load library behavior by, uh, um, shown by Python applications. I don't know if you are aware of that, but when you launch the Python container, it greedily goes out on the file system and tries to find all the .so's that are linked to the packages that you import, that your application uses. The problem is that when you do this on a parallel file system, uh, at some point it starts choking, okay? So there is a, an upper bound. Every parallel file system has an upper bound on the number of instances of a Python interpreter that you can, you can launch at one time. So this test simulates that. So what we compared, of course, is the work clock time for container and native applications using uh, Pynamic. And uh, it contains three different times. Uh, Pynamic tell you, tells you the times that it takes for the application to start up, the times, the times that it would take for the application to import the modules, and to visit every single 
of, of the SOs that your, your Python application actually relies on. And we did these test cases, or this, this test in particular, uh, using over 3,000 MPI processes. And this is what we got. So in the vertical axis, you can see the, the time that it takes for the application to start. The red column is the native application, so the native um, version of the Pynamic test case, whereas the blue column shows the, um, the time that it takes for the same Pynamic uh, test case uh, to start inside the shifter container. So we can see that, the, that uh, disregarding the number of the MPI ranks on a parallel file system, the overhead for this particular container to start, if started with a container, is almost constant. Whereas in the native case, it's not only much slower, but it also, you know, it, 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 it changes depending on the, on the number of MPI ranks that you use. So what happens here? What is actually happening? The container itself is only one file on the parallel file system. We are using SquashFS to create a binary of the complete tree of your container and only has one entry of metadata in that parallel file system. That's why there is no overhead here. It doesn't matter if you have tens of thousands or millions of files inside your container image, it will just be one file and one metadata entry on the parallel file system. And that's why we can scale so well when accessing that. Okay? Okay, so let's start wrapping up. So what did we see? As I started saying before actually starting the presentation, I said I would like to motivate this, but we saw during this two days, and I'm sure every single one of you have seen already containers in different aspects of, uh, or different parts of our work, daily workflows. So it is clear, you know, that disregarding of the fact that we want to include them in our workflows or not, containers are mature technology that are here to stay. Now, the particular combination, the particular Docker shifter combo that I just presented takes us the HPC providers or the HPC service providers one step closer to the turnkey cloud-like based solutions for computing with scalability and high performance. I'm not saying it's the ultimate solution, but it's definitely something that looks much better than compiling everything from scratch. In particular, what the use cases that I showed you highlight is bare metal provisioning, when you launch the container, when the runtime creates the file system for you, it mounts local file systems and it gives you access to the hardware on the host. Ready to use hard performance software stacks because the switch is done automatically. You don't care about that. That is done by the system and it's straight out of the system you're accessing, all right? okay? Of the system you're using. You get network file system support, okay, so you can add, access your scratch and your home on the network as if you were using standard SSH access or native access. And you get also, for free, access to hardware accelerations like GPUs and the high-speed interconnect uh, by using MPI. Thank you very much. <laughs>